A while ago, I had this adventure in Zion National Park, Utah. It's a stunning place, but sometimes it feels a bit strange, too. I work as a forest protector there, and Zion at night is like stepping into a different world. The tall cliffs make shadows, and the moon makes everything look magical. Most nights it's calm, but near the Virgin River, things can feel odd sometimes, and that's how it was that night. I enjoy working in the park. I've been there for a long time, walking trails, looking after campers, checking on animals, and even helping in emergencies. Sure, the park can feel spooky sometimes, but the joy of my job makes up for it. On that night, I was out with Tim, a friend and colleague, and they call us the late night crew, taking care of the park while everyone else sleeps. That night, we were doing our usual tasks, checking trails, making sure fires were out, and watching wildlife. We keep an eye out at night to make sure animals stay away from campgrounds and everything's normal in their world. We were having a normal night with the sounds of nature around us when we noticed something was off. Suddenly, we both felt a strange coldness and a strong, weird smell like burnt wood or sulfur. Even though it was quiet, we sensed something wasn't right. Then it began. Low growls like they were coming from the ground, and a really strange howl, unlike anything I've heard before. That sound made me shiver, and it echoed through the park. It was hard, but we stayed calm, trying to find where the sounds were coming from. One thing was clear. It wasn't an ordinary animal, and that's when things started to get scary. It felt like we had walked into a place we shouldn't be, somewhere unusual. It was scary, but also fascinating, like watching a powerful storm. Moving closer to where the sounds came from, we saw a shadow moving just beyond our flashlight's reach. It was big, fast, and moved in a way that was too purposeful for a wild animal. It was hard to see clearly, just a dark, shifting shape among the trees, and those howls and growls continued, making the ground shake. And that sulfur smell got stronger as we got closer, then we realized we weren't dealing with normal park animals, and our work for the night became much more dangerous. Suddenly, everything went silent. It was eerily quiet, not a sound in the park. I was about to say something when Tim put his hand on my shoulder and pointed to a dark spot near the river. I followed his gaze, my heart pounding as I saw a large shadowy figure that hadn't been there before. At first, I thought it was just a huge wild animal. It was big, standing about four and a half feet tall at the shoulder, but it wasn't bulky like a bear. This thing was lean and muscular, built for speed. Its movements were strange, unlike anything I'd seen, but what frightened me the most were its eyes glowing red in the darkness. We didn't move, didn't even breathe, as we watched it. Then it turned towards us, its glowing eyes seeming to pierce through the darkness. I could see matted dark fur, or maybe scales. It was hard to tell, and it stank. The smell of sulfur was so strong it made my eyes water. Just when we decided to retreat, it growled so loudly the ground shook and we could feel it beneath our feet. That growl was deep and angry, unlike anything I'd ever heard. I felt it in my bones, and I was sure we were in its territory now. I don't know how long we stood there, frozen in fear, as the creature stared at us silently. Then suddenly it leapt away, the ground trembling slightly as it ran. We watched its glowing eyes disappear into the night, and then everything was silent again, really silent. Back at the station, we couldn't sleep. We sat there drinking coffee, thinking about what happened. We thought we knew the forest, but this? This really got to us. We're not easily frightened, but this was different. The encounter made my night patrols a lot scarier, but it also made me realize how much we don't understand about the forest at night. We mostly kept it to ourselves, like a secret between me and Tim. But the memory of it stays, a spooky story only whispered among close friends. Whether it was our imagination or something more sinister, we'll never know. But those menacing fiery eyes and the growls that echoed through the night felt too real to ignore. Now, when I do my late night patrols, it's not just about checking for fires or animals. Let's just say I have a newfound respect for the night, for everything in it, seen or unseen. There's comfort in the light of day, but there's also something captivating about the mysteries hidden in the moonlit shadows. Strange encounters like this really show what my job is about. Protecting, serving, even when faced with the unexplainable in the dark. 
Since that night, my perspective on the forest, the night, has changed, and there's so much we don't know. Let me tell you a strange encounter I had, even though you might not believe it. Even my buddy who was there with me still thinks it's made up. I'm Sam, a student from Fresno, California. Last year, during the big lockdown, I met a friend named Lily from Oregon online. We really clicked and decided to meet in person, but instead of just hanging out for a weekend, we planned a big road trip across the country before school started again. What could possibly go wrong? Turns out a lot. Before we even got to New York, we faced so many problems. We had terrible experiences with places we stayed in, got a flat tire, and argued a bunch of times, but the scariest part was our night in New York. My folks always said never to say mean things about someone, but I have to admit, Lily acted way different in person than she did online. Nothing seemed to make her happy, but I tried my best to show her a good time. By the time we reached New York, things between us were pretty rough. She'd been calling her mom and crying a lot, and even talked about flying back home early. I didn't want us to break up before giving our friendship a real chance, so I looked up a romantic place called the Falling Waters Preserve in rural New York. I thought maybe it could save our trip. Finding the place was harder than I thought, and Lily got mad at me for getting us lost. When we finally arrived, it was dark, and we couldn't even see the falls. We were just walking around in the dark woods for no reason. Lily went ahead on the trail, swatting mosquitoes, and I followed behind. Then I heard this strange clicking noise. It sounded like when you pull tight on a zip tie, but it didn't stop. Plus, I heard rustling in the bushes all around me. Hey, Lily, I called out, hoping she was just playing a prank on me, but she didn't answer. I thought maybe it was just a small animal making noise, like a rabbit or squirrel. They can make funny sounds sometimes, right? I kept walking towards the car, but I saw something white move quickly beside me in the woods. I turned and saw the weirdest thing ever staring right at me. It was about as tall as me, but it was on all fours like a dog, with its back legs bent strangely, and it looked like a pale naked person with no nose or hair anywhere on its body. Its eyes were completely black. I was so scared that I couldn't move. I stood there shaking, and then it opened its mouth to reveal sharp teeth and a long tongue, and it made this horrible screeching noise. Then it ran off into the woods. I ran back to the car and found Lily waiting inside. I started telling her what happened, but she didn't believe me at first. When she finally looked up from her phone, she saw that I had wet myself. The next morning Lily caught a plane home and hasn't talked to me since. She thinks I made up the whole story to cover up wetting my pants, but I know what I saw. I looked it up online and found out about something called the rake, and I'm sure that's what I saw in those woods that night. That creature was the second scariest thing I encountered on our trip. It's really comforting to have a group of people who understand when I talk about unusual things that happened to me. I wasn't really into strange stories until a few years ago when something happened to me in the Humboldt County area that made me believe in them. Do you know that this part of California is pretty far away from other places? It's also very beautiful, but every year many people go missing there. I live in Nevada, but my cousin, who I'm close to, lives in California. Back in 2012, when I was about to go to college, we decided to go on a road trip through Northern California before I moved into a dormitory. Let's call my cousin Todd to keep his name private. He knows a lot about the northern part of California and likes to do adventurous things. I wanted our trip to be safe, and Todd agreed so we planned to drive up the famous 101 and then go east on 299, which goes through a nice mountain area I was excited to see. At that time, Todd was driving a very old Nissan car. There was even a hole in the floor on the passenger side, so I had to be careful where I put my feet. It was late summer and the weather was great. As we drove further north, it got cooler, so we had the windows down and listened to Todd's awesome playlist. We stayed in motels for the first few nights and visited towns like Eureka. We met two of Todd's friends there, and they decided to join us on our drive. While driving, we started sharing stories about strange things that had happened to us. I didn't have much to share because I had a pretty ordinary life. 
but one of Todd's friends, Catherine, was really interested in these kinds of stories. She had experienced a few strange things herself. At first we laughed and teased Catherine a bit, but as we talked more about it, it became clear that she was upset because we didn't believe her. The atmosphere in the car changed, maybe because it was getting dark. We were on 299, not too far along, when Todd saw a nice spot to camp by the side of the road, so we decided to stop there. I love camping, but that night, I felt uneasy. I thought it was because of Catherine's spooky stories, which were getting stranger and stranger. I tried to ignore it. Todd and I shared a tent, and his friends set up a fire to cook some food while we pitched the tent. That night was quiet and nothing unusual happened. Now here's where things get strange. Even talking about it now I feel a bit embarrassed, but I think sharing it will help me get over it, so the next morning one of Todd's friends mentioned a waterfall nearby down a dirt road and we decided to go there. It was a popular hiking spot and there were other cars parked there, so we didn't think anything was wrong. I changed into boots, we grabbed our bags and water, and started hiking into the woods. It was a beautiful day but it was surprisingly dark under the trees. The hike started off flat, but soon it started going uphill, which made sense since we were heading to a waterfall. We came to some switchbacks, and from there, we could see mountains and the fog rising up from the valleys, which I love about being in the mountains. About halfway into the hike, we reached a switchback with a clear view. Across from us, on a rocky face, we saw a figure. At first, Todd thought it was a bear, but it moved like a person. The girls and I backed away from the trail because we felt uncomfortable. The figure turned, and we could see it was a guy wearing a dark cloak, almost like a robe. I couldn't see his face clearly. Seeing someone like that in the woods was strange, and it felt like he was waiting for something. Todd was tense, and I had a bad feeling that something bad would happen if the guy saw us. Luckily, a family with kids came down the trail, and Todd had to move aside. It kind of broke the tension. It was hard to act normal, but when I looked back, the guy was gone. We waited for a few minutes after the family passed, and then we all agreed to go back to the car. None of us wanted to stay in the woods with whatever that was. We hurried back, got into the car, and drove away. We weren't going to camp there that night. Later, Catherine reluctantly told us a story about something called the Dark Watchers, I looked it up later and it seems like what we saw might have been one of them. They're mysterious beings in the woods who watch travelers like us. According to legends, they're harmless unless you make eye contact with them. I'm not sure what happens then, but people have disappeared after encountering them. It makes me wonder how many missing people in Humboldt County have seen Dark Watchers. This is the first time I've talked about it. Only Todd and the girls know what happened that day. I could have shared it as an icebreaker when I started college, but people might have thought I was weird. Even though it was scary, it's good to know about these things. Now I'm more cautious and aware. As days went by, I couldn't shake off the scary stuff happening in the sewer. It made it hard for me to focus on my plumbing work. I worried that something bad had happened because of me. Whenever I went into a dark, wet basement or crawled under a house for pipe checks, I felt scared. Despite my unease, life went on, and I continued with my plumbing jobs, albeit with a newfound wariness. However, the incident in the sewer lingered in the back of my thoughts like a persistent shadow, refusing to be ignored. One evening, while I was out for a walk to clear my head, I happened upon an old bookstore tucked away in a quiet corner of the town. Intrigued, I stepped inside, the scent of ancient books filling my senses. As I examined the shelves, my eyes fell upon a dusty tome nestled among other curious volumes. Its title, Secrets of the Underground, Myths, Legends, and Realities, appealed to me, and I found myself drawn to its damaged pages. Flipping through the book, I stumbled upon passages detailing accounts of mysterious occurrences in sewers and forgotten tunnels beneath cities. One story in particular caught my attention, a tale of strange creatures said to dwell in the depths, lurking in the shadows and preying upon unsuspecting souls. 
According to the author, these beings were ancient guardians of the underground realms, feared by those who ventured too deep into their domain. As I read on, a chilling realization dawned upon me. The events in the sewer might not have been a mere coincidence, but rather a glimpse into a world beyond our understanding. Could it be that the creatures spoken of in the book were more than just legends? Determined to uncover the truth, I delved deeper into the book, scouring its pages for any clues that might shed light on the mysteries beneath our feet. With each revelation, my curiosity grew, tempered only by a lingering sense of dread. Armed with newfound knowledge, I resolved to confront the homeowner once more, to seek answers to the questions that plagued my mind. Gathering my courage, I paid him a visit, the weight of guilt heavy upon my shoulders. As we sat down to talk, I brought up the subject cautiously, recounting the events that had transpired in the sewer and expressing my concerns about the safety of the workers who ventured into its depths. To my surprise, the homeowner's expression darkened, and he revealed a secret that sent shivers down my spine. He confessed that strange occurrences had plagued his home for years, whispers of unseen entities and inexplicable phenomena haunting the halls. He spoke of shadows that moved of their own accord, of eerie whispers that echoed in the dead of night, and of a presence that lurked just beyond the edge of perception. In hushed tones, he recounted tales passed down through generations, stories of ancient rites performed in forgotten tunnels beneath the city, and of beings that defied explanation. And then, with a serious gaze, he revealed the truth that chilled me to the core. The creatures in the sewer were real. With a heavy heart, I listened as he spoke of encounters with the residents of the Deep, of workers who had vanished without a trace, their fate a grim reminder of the dangers that lurked below. And as he spoke, I realized that the responsibility weighed not only upon my shoulders, but upon all who dwelled above the hidden world beneath our feet. As I left the homeowner's house that evening, my mind raced with thoughts of the mysteries that lay hidden in the darkness, of the creatures that roamed unseen beneath the city streets. And though fear tormented my soul, a spark of curiosity burned within me, driving me ever deeper into the shadows in search of answers to the secrets of the underground. Once upon a time, when I was staying at the Athenaeum Hotel in a little town called Chautauqua, New York, something strange happened. You might wonder why I was there in that far western part of New York. Well, I really love history, especially places with lots of stories from the past and the Athenaeum Hotel. It's like a big treasure chest full of history. This hotel was built in the 1880s, so you can imagine all the cool stuff that's happened there. Famous people visited and there were lots of events over the years, so I went there to soak up all the history and maybe feel like I was living in the past for a bit. But what I experienced was way more surprising than I thought it would be. It was a typical autumn evening when I got there and the hotel looked even more amazing as the sun was setting. The trees around were all red and orange, making everything look like a picture on a postcard. When I checked in, the people working there were super friendly. They showed me to my room on the third floor, and guess what? It had an awesome view of the lake. Before dinner, I decided to explore the hotel a bit. The halls were filled with old pictures and paintings that told stories about the past. But there was this one picture that caught my eye. It was a photo of the hotel staff from a long time ago. Everyone was looking at the camera, except for one guy at the back. He was looking away like he saw something interesting or maybe even scary. At that moment, I didn't think much of it. Dinner was fun and the dining hall was really fancy. After eating, I went for a walk around the hotel grounds. The air was cool and the sound of leaves under my feet was nice. When I got back to my room around nine in the evening, strange things started happening. I was reading a book when I heard whispering. At first, I thought it was just the hotel making noises, but it got louder and clearer, and it sounded like someone was whispering right outside my door. I went to check, but there was nobody there. The whispering stopped, so I thought maybe my mind was playing tricks on me because of all the history in the hotel. But then, in the corner of my room, I saw a man. 
He was wearing old-fashioned clothes, like the people in the picture I saw earlier. His face was hard to see, but it felt like he was looking right at me. I blinked, thinking maybe I was imagining things, but when I opened my eyes again, he was still there. I felt scared and confused. Was this a joke? Was the hotel trying to scare people? I finally got the courage to say something. Hello? I said, but he didn't answer, but just stood there. When I reached for the lamp, he disappeared, like magic. I sat there, not sure what to think. Was it a ghost? I didn't believe in ghosts, but what I saw was real. I didn't sleep much that night, and every little noise made me jump. In the morning, I was tired but curious. I wanted to know more about the man I saw. I asked the lady at the front desk about the hotel's history, hoping she might know something. She told me lots of interesting stuff, but avoided talking about anything strange. So I went to the library and found an old journal from someone who used to work at the hotel. In it, they talked about a man named Edward who worked there and died in a lake nearby. They said he acted strangely before he died, like he heard voices. I felt a connection between Edward and the man I saw, and it was like they were the same person. Later, I found Edward's name under the picture in the hallway. My heart raced. It was him. I spent the day trying to learn more about Edward, and people told stories about him hearing voices and acting weird. Some even said he haunted the hotel after he died. I felt scared, but also curious. I wanted to know if Edward's ghost was real. The next day, I visited Edward's grave in the cemetery. I talked to him, hoping he would hear me and find peace. When I went back to the hotel, I felt different. I wasn't as scared as before, but that night I heard whispering again. It felt softer this time, like someone saying goodbye. Leaving the hotel the next day, I couldn't stop thinking about what happened. Maybe ghosts are real, or maybe it was just my imagination, but one thing's for sure. My time at the Athenaeum Hotel was an adventure I'll never forget. You know those moments that change everything? Like in a story where you can say, and that's when everything changed? Well, I had one of those. I'm just an ordinary guy. Grew up in a small town where everyone knows each other, and if you don't wave back, you're probably having a bad day. I've been working at the big factory just outside of town since I finished high school, 20 years this May. Most of those years I've been on the night shift. It's a huge place, like a giant gray box sitting in the middle of nowhere. I keep to myself there, always have. I enjoy solitude, and I'm not into going to bars or church socials. I prefer a quiet night and a clear sky. Mom used to say I take after my dad, who was quiet and liked being alone. He was a truck driver, away most weeks, so it was mostly just me and Mom. She passed away a couple of years back from cancer. It was tough, especially since Dad was gone too, so I guess that's why I took to the night shift. Less people, less noise, just me and the machines, since the plant is mostly automated. I never minded being alone, and there's a rhythm to the night that you start to feel after a while. It becomes a part of you, and I like it that way. When I step out for a smoke, it's quiet, with no one trying to make small talk. Just the sound of the highway in the distance, with the occasional big truck passing through. It's not exciting, but it's my life, and it was enough for me, until that night. The night started like any other, and the factory's hum was a steady sound in the background. I usually took my breaks around the same time, give or take, but this one was at 2.30 in the morning. There's a spot out back, a little corner between some storage units where I can see the stars pretty clear. I'm no expert, but over the years I've learned to spot constellations. I felt strange that night even before I saw it, like I was dizzy or something, like gravity or the earth was leaning the wrong way. I zipped up my jacket, put my hands in my pockets, and walked my usual route along the edge while finishing my cigarette. And then I saw it. It's interesting how your brain tries to make sense of things and tries to fit them into boxes it understands, but this… this didn't fit into any box I knew. It was just there, hovering above the trees, making no sound. No lights, no engines, nothing. Just a shape against the stars. I stood there, trying to make sense of it, wondering if anyone else in town was looking up and seeing what I was seeing, but I knew they probably weren't because it was the middle of the night, 
So it was just me and this thing, whatever it was. Now I have a pretty strict system in my life. Everything is organized and orderly. I believe that's how you keep chaos at bay, so when I saw this anomaly in the sky, it wasn't just curious. It was unsettling and it bothered me a lot. I'd like to say I ran inside, grabbed a camera, or tried to call someone, but I didn't. I just stood there, rooted to the spot. I knew my break was over and work was waiting, but none of that mattered in that moment. This shape, it was like a shadow, but not quite, and it moved with purpose, not tossed around by the wind. It was like it was alive in its own way. It came closer, and I could see it wasn't one solid mass, but it was made up of different parts, like a silent puzzle of darkness. There was no sound, no big show. It was just a quiet night on a Wednesday with this silent visitor. It felt like it was studying me, trying to figure out who I was and what my life was all about. I thought about all the stories I'd heard, the late night shows with people talking about lights in the sky and lost time. I used to laugh at them, the same way I laughed at horoscopes and fortune telling. But there I was, living out a story that no one would believe. It hung there for a while and I felt something. Not exactly fear, but it was more like understanding. It's hard to explain, but it's like when you're a kid and you think there's a monster in your closet. But when you finally look, it's just an old baseball glove. Except this felt different. Strange, I know. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, it started to drift away. It didn't zoom off at lightning speed. It just moved slowly until it was gone, like mist fading at dawn. Just gone. And the stars were back and the sky was normal again. I checked my watch. It was hard to see in the dark, but I could make out the time. I hadn't lost any time, hadn't been whisked away to another dimension. It was just later and I was still there, the same as always, except now I'd missed part of my break. I went back inside, my mind racing with thoughts and the machines didn't care about my strange encounter. Why should they? They were just machines. Eventually the sun started to rise, so I clocked out, got in my Ford and drove home along the same road as always. But that morning, I didn't look up at the sky because I wasn't ready to see it just yet. I needed time to think. I kept my eyes on the road, hands steady on the wheel, the familiar route home comforting me after the night's oddness. In the rearview mirror I caught a glimpse of light and wondered how I would deal with this going forward. Because now, despite my love for the ordinary and predictable, my world had changed. There was a before and now there was an after, and I was somewhere in between just driving home.